In the deep dark, the Aslan are moving, but there is a darker power. There is something behind the claw. Welcome to episode 23 of the Behind the Claw podcast, a show for fans of the classic traveller RPG. I'm Felbrick Napoleon Herriot. Let's start the show by taking a look in the email vault. Justin has written in to ask a question which reads, Help! I gave my player characters a gun that's really stupidly too powerful for the intended situation. It doesn't make sense to give all the bad guys really heavy armour. Now that's quite a good question, and it's not the first time I've heard someone mention it. To this I reply, no, you haven't given them too powerful weapons. In the last mercenary campaign I ran, the PCs were running around with FGMPs. Under the standard rules, these kill if they hit. That's the type of weapon they are, it's just so powerful. Yet it worked perfectly well in the game. The trick here is to counter the weapons in a way that fits the genre. Remember that when the Enterprise came across the Borg and fired weapons that could normally destroy a city in a heartbeat, the writers just invented a shield system that invalidated those weapons, and you can do something similar. An EMP grenade can stop lasers working. I've had Aslan using pop-up reflect-like shields, magnetic repulsors to deflect bullets and shrapnel. Any number of high-tech weapons can be used to counter or reduce the effectiveness of these super-powerful weapons. However, you don't want to do this every time, as your players will get frustrated. As another tool for this situation, just change the scene. If the PCs are burning down buildings, put innocent hostages in there. If they're chucking grenades around, put the only computer access point in that room. The point here is, you need to change the situation from a simple PC versus villain to something with a twist. Of course, you could follow my example and drop in the occasional super fauna as well that has hundreds of hits too. That's always fun. Thanks for the question, Justin. Robert has written in to say that he's been playing Traveller since 83. That, sir, deserves a fanfare. And through those years, Robert has been a user of the experience rules that I spoke about last time although he does admit he's never played a single character through the eight years of game time to turn a temporary skill increase into a permanent one. But that's totally legit. If the rules are stopping you from having fun, then doing this is the way to go. If I remember correctly, you can have up to two of these on the go at once, so you can use it in quotes to reward players if they need a bone chuck their way. It's good to know the rules are working. Robert also asked about fiction on this show. Well, I'm still looking for submissions. Anything up to about a thousand words is good. The best would be short stories in the flash fiction range of around 500 words. Anything travellerish will be considered, although I don't want anything smutty or overly gory. Think action and adventure, or something with a twist, perhaps. I look forward to hearing from any budding authors. Thanks for the email, Robert. The last one for today is from Jerry in Colorado who's joined the great classic Traveller Resurgence. He played back in 78, and he's now rereading the little black books. Welcome back to the club. Jerry says he remembers taking a week off high school to design ships. I reckon that was pretty much worthwhile. In that week, you'll have learnt more about spatial design limitations, mathematics and loan agreements than you would ever have learnt in school. Talking of which... I'll have to have a deep dive into High Guard in an upcoming episode. Thanks for getting in touch, Jerry. And now, on to the first segment. I have no idea. So, computer, what can you tell me about this place? This is my galaxy, where I tell you about a planet in the Tercesso subsector. A map and planetary UPPs are available on the podcast's website at behindtheclaw.blogspot.co.uk. Pedus Radus is currently under an amber warning from the Traveller's Aid Society. This only applies to the surface of the planet, as the forces involved in the ongoing conflict are under an imperial embargo against near-space conflict. The planet itself is large and has an appropriately stronger gravity of about 1.25g. 
casual visitors are advised to plan ahead and be prepared for short working days as the additional gravity will add considerable strain to all activities. Inflatable pneumatic emergency beds are available in the starport and should be carried by visitors at all times. The atmosphere is categorized as insidious by the Imperial Scouting Service due to its corrosive and poisonous attributes. Visitors are warned to avoid prolonged exposure to the atmosphere in standard vac suits, the seals of which will fail rapidly. The locals have developed a special suit for travelling on the surface, which uses a water chemical mix to constantly irrigate the outer surface of their vac suits. This prolongs the life of the suit, but the supply of water that can be carried is limited not only by the water's mass, but by the capability of the individual to cope with the load under such high gravity. The dirt-side starport is capable of handling large shuttles up to 100 tonnes if they are of standard configuration, and entry into the underground facilities are via a shuttle-sized airlock system. The majority of the population live beneath ground, within habitats built into the impermeable rock of the planet. The habitats, although technically underground, are generally built into the sides of mountains, allowing easy egress at ground level. In recent months, the war that has raged between the two main settlements on Pedus Radus has quietened down. This less warlike state has been imposed on the combatants after a shuttle was rigged to explode in the space-side starport. Fortunately, it did not explode before being caught, but it did encourage the scouting service colonel in charge of the in-system Imperial Scout Base to put a temporary complete ban on space travel to or from the planet. This embargo slowly brought the two sides to their senses and pulled them back from the brink of a nuclear war. Although currently peaceful and the embargo has been lifted, the atmosphere is of armed peace. A number of scouting service vessels regularly patrol the planet, and they do this as part of a maintenance plan for the peace project. Traders will find that the planet will readily pay a premium for off-world goods. No, oh, no, no way. The way I heard it is that he was shipping arms, guns, you know, taking them straight in, under the navvy's nose. It's time for another story seed. The planet of Is is permanently under light-blocking permaclouds. No light reaches the surface. This has led the planet into building and maintaining a large number of big orbital farms. Each such farm is managed by a small group of farmers and a number of robotic assistants. The ownership of farms is split between the nation-states of Is, and of late there have been a number of sabotaging attacks. The PCs get involved as private investigators, hired by an independent newspaper. The newspaper is interested in the story more than in bringing justice, although if the story does go that way they might follow it up. The players are given a budget which will easily get eaten up by the transport costs and accommodation. You can start the players looking at one of the sabotage farms, where everyone and most of the farm crops were killed when the oxygen mix was sabotaged. They might also want to investigate the companies that run the farms in competition with each other. Each of the big companies has a good motive to interfere with the other companies because of the associated hiking prices that follows a farm going out of business. Around the farms is a secondary business of delivering the foodstuffs to the surface. This business, or rather businesses, build one-time-use drop pots. Large containers with heat shields and parachutes are manufactured in space from asteroid materials and then used to drop the food to the surface. Although it is an expensive process, it is still cheaper than fueling shuttles backwards and forwards. Other sabotages include misdropped food pods, a farm falling out of orbit and burning up, another farm flying higher out of orbit that had to be abandoned, irrigation water on the farms being poisoned, crop seed delivered to the farms dead and evidence suggesting that it had been exposed to vacuum. The perpetrators of these crimes are all independent, and don't know each other, but they are being financed, not by a rogue farm company, but by a share trader, who is playing the local market. Each time an event damages a company profits, he's there making money as the share prices dip and rise. If the players push the investigation, they might manage to get his name and crack this story. The editor of the newspaper will keep pushing the PCs for a story or multiple stories, and push them to get involved and to dig deeper. No, sir, you may not dock here. What the hell? 
I just made three jumps to get here. Without Permit 7C, you may not dock. Now move out to the holding line at 6,000 kilometres. This is the Rules Talk section, where I look at some aspect of the classic traveller rules or canon. Today I thought I'd share my thoughts on the Scout Courier, a standard configuration and probably one of the most manufactured ships in the Imperium. Let's start with a look at the specs. A 100-ton hull, a jump drive capable of giving jump 2 capability, manoeuvre drive giving manoeuvre 2, 40 tons of fuel, minimal computer, four staterooms, no weapons although it does have a hard point, and it carries an air raft and has three tons set aside for cargo. My first thoughts are that this is not much of a scout craft. Its fuel supply allows it to do a single jump 2 or two jump 1s, if these ships were planned to scout out and discover what's out there, they're rather limited to using Jump 1 in order to avoid becoming stranded in an empty parsec or in a system with no fuel. The hull is streamlined, meaning it can scoop fuel from gas giants or seas, but if they're scouting in unknown regions, there's no guarantee of finding anything. So if these are to be used to map a completely unknown subsector, they would need to be part of a fleet operation that provides fuel and possibly even carriage for the scout ships, something like a supercarrier, for instance. As supercarriers are going to be hard to move and inefficient, I suspect that the better organisation for the scouting service would be a fleet of smaller ships. Perhaps this would be a few destroyers to act as escort, a large number of fuel tankers in the 600-ton range. These are stripped down to carry nothing but fuel. Perhaps they'd need a few fuel-scooping facilities as well and fuel processing. And of course a good number of scout courier craft would need to be part of this fleet. I can see such a fleet moving along the subsector map, pushing scouts out ahead and to either side of the main path of travel. That would be a slow process. A week for the scout to jump out, a week of in-system investigation perhaps, and jump back to the fleet, and then on to the next round of hexes. But a week in a system is really next to no time at all for the scout vessel. They wouldn't really be able to travel anywhere in the system unless they happened to hit the system near a planet to start with. Maybe they'd spend longer in system, a couple of weeks perhaps, on such a scout mission. But anyway, back to the scout ship itself. Four staterooms, the bridge and engineering doesn't sound like a lot of space for four crew on a prolonged period. But if we consider what they do today on the ISS, I guess it is completely doable. But not necessarily very pleasant. I imagine planet leave would be a treasured time after that. I suspect this ship makes a better courier than a scout for searching the unknown if it can only jump to an adjacent system. But being streamlined, it could land on a destination planet, and the air raft that it carries means it could easily travel to the recipient. So specialised courier work could work for this type of ship. Although I do find it odd that it doesn't have the five tonne of cargo space required for mail work. Now having said that, it does only require a crew of one, which means the other three staterooms are available for use for smaller cargoes. I suspect that the ship's design is almost perfect for a traveller party. The lack of a fitted weapon is likely to give the PCs pause for thought, but of course they just need to avoid pirates, and they won't have any issues. And good luck with that. The party, of course, wouldn't be doing a lot of legal trading, as standard cargoes would be unlikely to pay their way. Did you hear that? What the hell do you think it is? Is it dangerous? This is the Creature Catalogue, where I tell you about one of the alien creatures that can be found in and around the Imperium. The Slatheran is a hexapedal hunter that originates on the planet of Zafana. They have a status of renown and disrepute on the world, and are regarded with a wry admiration. On the day the scouting service first landed on the planet to start the usual cataloguing, the first Imperial servant was killed within an hour of stepping foot on the surface by a Slatheran. The rest of the team didn't notice for some hours as they were themselves overcome by the insidious hallucinogenic atmosphere. The Slatheran weighs in at about 180 pounds, has a powerful bite, and all six paws are armed with strong rending claws. In this initial attack, it bit through the scout's suit and proceeded to shred both suit and man with its claws. 
The reproduction process of this warm-blooded animal is a little unusual. Although split into male and female sexes, mating requires a third, or rather a second male. The first male and female mate as usual, but a second male is required in order for it to take. The second male's attention is limited to an inquisitive sniffing of the female. If the female does not receive attention in this way from a second male, then the mating will come to nothing. Some scientists have suggested that the attention of the second male proves the female's suitability for breeding. At various times in the history of Zephana, the Slatheran has been hunted for its pelt. But, as it's a sly and creditable predator itself, hunters have often been led to wonder if they were doing the hunting or being hunted. There have been a number of attempts at farming, but these have been unsuccessful. They do not breed when in caged captivity, and have proved very good at escaping from larger pens. The animal's climbing ability is legendary, and combined with its strength, a fence is not substantial enough to retain it, and the walls of sufficient height and overhang would be too expensive to maintain in this corrosive atmosphere. The treasured pelts of the Slatheran consist of a dense fur that usually includes a range of colours that vary from animal to animal. One pelt might contain brown, green and yellow, another might be red, torn and green. Each pelt tends to vary wildly from all others, and thus the uniqueness is one of the saleable features. Xenobiologists have studied the DNA in an attempt to understand this variability of colouring, which does not seem to offer any camouflageable benefit, nor play any part in mating rituals or suitability to breed. It stands today as one of the mysteries that surround this man-killer. As there is no raising of animal stock on the surface of Zafana, and with the atmosphere being so insidious, there's never been any real need to wipe out this slatheran. The only precautions that need to be taken during the rare surface forays to protect the human workers is to make frequent use of orange-smelling olfactory grenades. These are non-lethal devices, and they simply exude a strong-smelling gas which repels the hexapeds. So I'm here. Why don't you tell me why you're cold? The spacer in the corner booth. Oh, don't stare at him. I see him. Who is he? It's the guy on the news vids. Which news vids? The thousands of channels. Cook watch. Ah, I see. This is the People of Interest segment, where I tell you about someone from the Imperium that has a bit of a reputation. The Baroness Chelida Antonia Tolindathina has always been in the limelight. From the time she was born to her aristocratic parents, she was lauded and surrounded by the press, who reported everything she did, wore and said. At every stage of her adolescence, she was a fashion icon, and was dressed by the best of designers. There had been rumours of discarded boyfriends and sacked tutors, but none of these could be confirmed. Why they were discarded, and why they wouldn't come forward to tell their stories, is a mystery. It has a darker side, and that has added a luster and mystery to this already attractive woman. When she reached her twenties, she became the favoured concubine of King Dionysus, who ruled her home world. This relationship seemed to proceed happily, with them appearing together at many public events and extravagances. There was obviously some strain when she had to appear at the same events as the king's wives, but nothing more than the occasional shared grimace was ever caught on camera by the newses. This all came to an end at a hollow gala event, during the after-show meal. There was an argument between the king and Chalida that ended with her throwing her fork down onto the table and storming out of the room. All of this was caught on camera, and of course became the major news story for a week or two, as the obviously acrimonious split resulted in Chalida taking up solitary residence in an apartment in an uptown part of the capital. The press delighted in watching as the king made a number of visits to Chilida, attempting to repair the rift that had formed. He was always rebutted, and not long after she left the planet to take up residence on another world, Goodenberry. Her arrival on the world was celebrated by the society press, and was a light relief to the unending news coverage of the Cold War that was threatening to turn hot. The two sides of this Cold War were led by two autocrats, who immediately both started wooing the Baroness 
in order to prove that their side was more appealing and better than the other. Chalida accepted the attentions and encouraged both leaders to visit her apartments, first one and then the other. This state of affairs continued for months, with the suitors gifting her greater and greater presence in an attempt to belittle their competitor. All the while the press and socialites went crazy about the baroness. An unassailable love for her was deliberately fostered in both camps, as the propaganda corps heaped up the publicity and the winning of her heart became a most serious business, with the emotional investment of both peoples of both sides. Then everything went quiet. The visits stopped for a while. It emerged later that she had secretly promised her hand in marriage to both of the leaders simultaneously, and had asked them to back off and to think about it for a while. Then, after a month, she would secretly meet them in a hotel at a resort. Both suitors followed her suggestion, and each arrived without knowing that the other was there, and in complete secrecy. The following morning, the Baroness made a speech, to which she had invited every major news outlet. The speech was astounding in its scope and its audacity. She told the world that she had been studying the two leaders, and had determined that they were not suitable as leaders, that the threat of war was down to the two of them. And then she dropped her bombshell, and explained that she had simply poisoned both men. Then she went on to explain that she would be glad to take a presidency over from both of them, and the Cold War would thus come to an end. There was a hushed pause that stretched around the world, followed by a massive cheer that some claimed was felt on the planet's primary moon. From that day onwards, she has reigned as president over the entire world. Thanks for the trade, Tuchel. It was a pleasure doing business with you. So long, sucker. And so we've reached the end game. But I would like to take the opportunity to tell you about a little referee's tool called 1,542 NPC Names. As the name suggests, it allows you to come up with names for NPCs at the drop of a hat. It also comes in a pocket mod format, which means it prints on a single sheet of paper and folds into a tiny booklet that you can drop into your top pocket, both handy and convenient. You can find 1,542 NPC names at drivethroughrpg.com. So once again, and as usual, if you have any thoughts, suggestions, questions, segment items, or stories, send them into behindtheclaw at outlook.com. This podcast is released on an attribution, non commercial, no derivatives license. Its home on the web is at behindtheclaw.blogspot.co.uk. Music by Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com. I'm your host, Felbrick Napoleon Herriot. Thanks for listening. Prepare for jumps.